Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee to order. It is Thursday, March 16th, 2023. Uh, we do have a quorum present. And today we are going to be begin our agenda with um, two bills from Senator McEwen. And so the first bill uh, we will hear is uh, Senate File 19038. So Senator McEwen, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Um, I uh, first have a technical amendment that I would like to be considered. Um, the amendment um, clarifies eligibility for the program that I'm going to tell you about, um, the pilot and the types of services offered, and also some reporting language. I believe it's the A1. Um, yes, we have the A1 amendment in our materials, and Senator Mann moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, I am very excited to present this bill today. Senate File 1903 is the Homeless Youth Direct Cash Transfer Pilot Bill brought forward in collaboration with the Opportunity Youth Network and others. This pilot proposal is a partnership to take place in St. Louis County, Hennepin County, and with homeless youth service providers, community-based organizations, and most importantly, our youth. With evidence-based practices in mind, Senate File 1903 is an effort to intentionally focus on homeless youth and give them the hand up needed to create stable, successful lives. There are a couple of handouts which provide more detail about the need and the mechanics of this proposal and where else similar models are happening around the country. But basically, this bill creates a four-year pilot in which this coalition works with an intermediary organization to allocate a monthly stipend to eligible homeless youth ages 18 to 24. In order for this pilot program to be effective, Senate File 1903 waives the stipend from counting as income. This enables individuals to maintain their eligibility and receive other services necessary to stabilize their lives and succeed. Madam Chair, to give you a face and voice to the challenges of homeless youth and how this pilot can address the situation, I have a handful of testifiers here to offer some brief remarks. And our first testifier, Madam Chair, is online. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Yes, the first testifier we have is Janae Peterson. And... Uh, Ms. Peterson, if you can turn your video on, then we can... Uh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Hello. Hello. Hi, welcome Hello. to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Janae Peterson. I work for the Hennepin County Youth Advisory Board. Um, today, I just wanted to uh, give you guys some statistics. The United States have 724 billionaires. To put it in perspective, that is 142 million hours for someone getting paid minimum. Uh, sorry, for someone getting paid minimum wage, they would need to uh, work 692. Oh, I'm so sorry, I messed this whole thing up. Uh, um, can I go sometime later, please? Uh, sure. If we can, we can. Let's, we can come back to you. Thank um, you, Madam Chair. Next, um, we have Jordan. That's okay. Um, Jordan Unison Christie and Laura Birnbaum. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Laura Birnbaum, and I work for St. Louis County Public Health and Human Services, supervising our housing and homelessness programs team. I am excited, hopeful, and grateful to be here today to express my support and encourage yours for SF-1903. We know that young adults ages 18 to 24 are overrepresented when it comes to facing homelessness. This is true not only in metro areas, but also in greater Minnesota rural communities like those found in St. Louis County. At the end of last week, 178 people ages 18 to 24 were unhoused in St. Louis County. This includes 131 single people, of which six are pregnant, and 41 families. The number of young people in our coordinated entry system is not decreasing, despite active efforts to expand permanent supportive housing and related programming. 
In St. Louis County, we see young people leaving unsafe situations, doing their best, and due to not feeling safe in traditional shelter spaces, most often will stay with friends, couch hop, or stay and seek shelter in places not meant for human habitation. We also see young people return to homelessness due to financial struggles that are no fault of their own. Young people are connected to benefits that provide a basic level of support, like food support through SNAP or health insurance with medical assistance. However, this doesn't get anywhere near the need for young people to access housing. Herein lies the gap that direct cash transfers could empower young adults to address. Young people need more tools where they can have ownership, more choices and flexibility to be able to utilize creativity in determining their own housing solutions. Where they can move out of crisis and surviving into thriving, creating the opportunity to break cycles of poverty and homelessness. And we would be able to learn from this work to replicate what works across the state due to the critical research component with Chapin Hall. Innovative programming that is responsive to young people's voices and their experiences is the solution. They are the experts. Please support SF1903. This is an amazing opportunity for you and for Minnesota to champion and lead in ending youth homelessness. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Unison Chisti. I'm the Executive Director of LifeHouse in Duluth. For over 32 years, LifeHouse has been working with homeless and streetwise youth ages 14 to 24 throughout the Northeast region and beyond. We are the primary access point for homeless young people trying to obtain housing. As someone who, has, who was homeless as a youth, I'm acutely aware of the struggles our young people face. We provide wraparound supportive services at no cost. We have a mental health and wellness team from licensed clinical social workers to licensed alcohol and drug counselors a licensed teacher to support young adults with their academic credentials. We employ youth on site to learn job skills and we operate the only drop-in youth center in our area. LifeHouse is a data-driven organization. We know of the 860 young people accessing our wraparound supportive services that 60% are indigenous black or multiracial, 30% identify as LGBTQ, 57% have experienced some form of abuse, and 43% are struggling with mental health concerns. My staff of over 40 people are the young people's trustworthy adults in their lives. We are their family. In our community housing program last year, we served 487 youth, completed 256 needs assessments where 182 young people are now on that wait list for housing. We also know that 80% of the youth in our housing program are connected to needed services in the community. 96% have maintained housing stability for over six months. 83% have increased their income. And 63% are working on recovering from substance misuse. I also want to know that we receive funding from the Homeless Youth Act to support our work I just mentioned in providing these vital and life-saving services. Senate File 1903 provides an additional critical component to interrupting the cycles of housing instability and legacy of poverty amongst our young people. By providing underserved young adults direct cash and documenting how this impacts their lives, this research-based pilot project provides us an opportunity to witness and be a part of creating a pathway out of homelessness for young people. This bill bolsters how we work alongside them to pursue their dreams in life. Most young people who access our supportive services are with us from five, eight, to 10 years. They have a team of people around them who are engaged in their healing process in order to thrive. Again, we are their family. These young people are our future generations and our future leaders. Please invest in our underserved young adults by supporting Senate File 1903. And thank you for your time, Madam Chair and members of the committee. And I appreciate your commitment to supporting our young people in our communities. Thank you very much. Next, I have Sarah Berger Gonzalez and Quincy Pau. And I apologize if I mispronounce your last name. Um, Ms. Berger Gonzalez, please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Berger Gonzalez, and I'm a senior policy analyst with Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, an independent nonprofit research and policy center. Chapin's Hall mission is to improve outcomes and well-being for individuals, families, and communities that experience adversity. I'm here today as lead of the evaluation team. 
Since 2019, collaborative teams have been working to develop, implement, and study the effectiveness of direct cash transfers with youth-driven supportive services as an intervention to address youth homelessness. Here in Minnesota, over the last 12 months, with initial funding from philanthropy, we have been working with young adults, with lived expertise, providers, local evaluators, local government, and implementation partners to adapt this model and evaluation for St. Louis and Hennepin counties. I'm here today to convey three main points concerning the current state of knowledge in this model. First, current housing solutions for youth and young adults are falling short of having a population level impact. Data show that youth face insurmountable challenges to accessing and securing housing, often languishing in homelessness for harmful periods of time. And for those who do secure housing, there is little evidence that current housing models help young people achieve long-term housing stability. To this end, direct cash transfers with supportive services offer a promising solution to addressing youth homelessness in Minnesota. Senate file 1903 presents an important opportunity to direct benefits to young people, potentially yielding cost benefit, excuse me, cost savings relative to status quo intervention models and expanding promise among young people at a critical time in their development. Second, we need a greater understanding of young people's pathways through and out of homelessness if we wish to inform sustainable systems level change. Even as we have learned much about the drivers of youth homelessness, we lack effective strategies to prevent it, minimize its impact, and avoid reoccurrence. Much of this has to do with a lack of, absent of excuse me, an absence of longitudinal data in Minnesota and nationally on young people's outcomes and pathways, especially after exiting shelters and homelessness programs. To this end, this bill will enable critical evidence building. With the right resources, we will learn together whether and how cash supports and services improve young people's housing situations, enable them to pursue education and vocation and more. The evaluation will be carried out with rigor and transparency, including periodic and final reports to this committee and the legislature as indicated. <laughs> Finally, an effective pilot project will anticipate, identify, and manage barriers to success so that recipients of cash transfers do not experience the benefit at the expense of other supports. In other words, a benefits cliff. The current provisions of this bill are quite germane to the success of this program and would enable young adults experiencing homelessness to participate in the pilot without impacting eligibility or receipt of public benefits. In closing, passing this legislation places Minnesota among innovators and sets precedent for other states to follow suit, laying the foundation for testing and scaling youth co-designed interventions to address homelessness. I wish to express my gratitude to the committee. Thank you for contemplating the support for this critical bill. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Dear Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Quin Dear Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Quincy Poe and I'm the Opportunity Youth Network co-lead at Youth Prize. Opportunity Youth are young people who experience homelessness, have been in the foster system, young parents, and are youth who are disconnected from educational resources and employment. Youth Prize has been stewarding this work using our connections with young adults and adult partners throughout the state to forward the best policy solutions. Throughout every aspect of doing this work, it has been in partnership with young people that we seek to serve. We conducted adaptation workshops with one, over 100 young people with lived experience in Hennepin County to learn from them, to understand what they would have wanted to move them from surviving to thriving. These would include housing navigation, mental health and chemical health resources, independent living skills, mentorship, and financial coaching. We, as the capacity support at Youth Prize, will do the same adaptation workshops and learn from young people in all parts of St. Louis County to design the same sorts of supportive services that young people may need there. We know that while young people have many things that are similar, the challenges of place can make things radically different. Young people are ready to make bold moves for themselves and their community. They just need the right supports to get there. As a former young person who has navigated homelessness in the Twin Cities myself, the impact of what direct cash transfers could have done for me would have been a game changer. Like many of the young people who have partnered with us on this work in the focus groups we've held, when I was a homeless young adult, I often ran into different barriers when trying to get help. Barriers that made me have to choose between the help that I could get, which would ultimately keep me sustained in the struggle that I was in. We have an opportunity to work with young adults in a way where we can be transformative, and move the needle forward. An opportunity to say that in Minnesota, we work to look at all options on the table that propel young adults in our community toward the right way. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, the last uh, testifier I have for in person is Hassan Asidik. Asidik? Again, apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and, and provide your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Committee. My name is Hassan Kais Asadiq. Thank you for having me here. I'm here to advocate in support of Senate File 1903, the Homeless Youth Cash Stipend Project. This is important to me because I have had the opportunity to use my unique lived experience to serve Hennepin County <coughs> in the role for this pilot program as a youth researcher with Chapin Hall's Policy Research Institute. I'm here today to let my neighbors know that the DCT model will work to reduce disparities that make it hard for young people to thrive. As a young person, I've navigated housing insecurity and the negative impact that generations of divestment has had on what opportunities are made accessible for young people in Minnesota. It is important to me that we as a state make a clear commitment to being more culturally responsive. Up until just three months ago, when I began to work at the same youth service drop-in center that I've been a service recipient at for several years, I had not experienced financial or housing security. This bill is important to me as it should be for all young professionals seeking to be a part of a thriving ecosystem where transformative experiences occur. We must be equally concerned with positive youth development as we are with fiscal responsibility. And in this bill, we realize the opportunity to do both, walk and chew gum. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, is Ms. Peterson, uh, would Ms. Peterson like to provide her testimony now? Madam Chair, it sounds like maybe she's not going to testify. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other comments before we go to member questions? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm just, just, um, I respectfully ask for the committee's support for this really exciting pilot project. Um, I think that we have an opportunity here to help a number of um, young people and to really um, do some good work to find out some more information about the best course of action and what is needed. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions or comments? Senator Edke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, uh, I've got some questions for uh, further clarity. Um, it is listed as a pilot project, but how did you come up with the two counties that have been selected? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Aki. I'm going to ask if um, one or more of my experts can come up to help um, address that question. Yes. Hello, Madam Chair and um, members. My name is Christy Snyder. I'm the other co-lead of the Twin Cities Opportunity Youth Network. Um, we came up with that in two ways. Hennepin County has um, the, one of the largest homeless populations, and so we went with Hennepin County. They received a, um, a Hennep they have a, a large population. They have an active YAB, which is a youth action board um, of homeless youth, and they were asking for it. Um, and then Hennepin County, or and then St. Louis County, we wanted to include um, a small smaller town and also a rural, a more rural area. And so working within St. Louis County, just because it's so large, um, we were able to get both and work with just one county. Senator Rodkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next uh, question I've got, um, this appropriation or grant would be to Youth Prize. How was Youth Prize selected? Senator McEwen, or the testifier? Thank you. Yeah, we were stewarding the work, and so um, it was more that we were working on it um, already and in partnership. So it was uh, partly the community-based organizations that were in the space um, were working in tandem with us. So I think it was just a natural fit. It wasn't a selection process. We were just in the work together. Senator Rodkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, along with that, then, um, we heard the one testifier from Duluth talking about the lighthouse. What is the relationship between Youth Prize and the lighthouse being this um, grant is dedicated to Youth Prize? 
So in this case, um, what will happen is that in the service provider area, young people will actually create an RFP um, for the services. And then young people will select the, the provider. Um, Youth Prize will help them to design that. And that's one of the things that Youth Prize is quite good at, is having um, young people design and implement RFPs. So uh, Lifehouse has been um, like all in Hennepin County and in St. Louis County. There's been multiple community-based organizations at the table. Um, and so there's no guarantee that Lifehouse will receive the funds. Um, similarly, we have connections to independents in the room. Um, they're a foster-serving organization in Hennepin County that has also been really um, prominent at the table. There's no guarantee that they would receive the funds either. That will all be driven by young people, and they will design it. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and that, now I kind of understand what you're doing there, and I spent uh, uh, some time last night looking at the Youth Prize website and trying to see how they do things and some of their past histories, et cetera. Um, one further question is, we refer to the, the stipend, but I see nothing in here that tells us what that possible, what the amount oh, yeah. could be, and then, how will they receive it? Because being homeless, not having a, a, an address or an account, um, how do we, how is that transfer proposed and, uh, um, you know, I guess what will they end up with? And can you give, your, give me your name again so I can make note of it? Uh, just Christy Snyder. Snyder, okay. At Youth Prize. And go ahead, Ms. Snyder, and you can answer the question. Sure. Um, that's a great question. So the amount of the um, funds, the direct cash transfers, is connected to the cost of local housing in that area. So we look at the HUD definitions of what um, the, the cost of shared housing would be in that local area. So in Hennepin County, we looked at that um, for the cost of a shared housing. So that was about $1,000. And so that is how much it would cost in, um, that, that is how much young people would receive because we're trying to sub out the amount of rent. Um, in St. Louis County, we'll have to look specifically in the two micro areas, both Duluth and then depending on where, I don't know where it will be in um, the rural parts of the St. Louis County. That's still not to be determined yet. Um, but that's how it will be, that's how we'll cost it out. And then in terms of how they will receive it, um, they're in other parts, like as Sarah Berger-Gonzalez said, that other places have used um, They've used Cash App, they've used Venmo, they've used different kinds of ways of getting the funding to young people with the intent of the financial coaching coming behind them so that eventually we can establish bank accounts and we want to ensure that they have stronger ways of building wealth. Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that just kind of brought up another thing that not knowing what the history or what you've seen, but when you're talking about handing out possible cash or Venmo and such, um, what percentage do we see that is received but not used for housing? Um, is there Has there been challenges there in the past? I mean, we're not doing it here, but we're patterning this off other places. Um, you know, at first, as you were talking about housing, thinking these, even though the stipends were listed as going to the youth, they might go right to the housing provider, the landlord, so that to make sure that that connection was made. Do we foresee challenges? Uh, Ms. Berger-Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator, thank you so much for the question. So what we've seen thus far um, is that young people are, are doing a couple of things with the money. One is they're saving it. Um, another thing is that, so with the housing, a lot of them are using it on housing, but young people are, as we're finding, are very creative. And so some of it is going toward housing, but other, some of it is also going toward um, meeting basic needs. Um, we have found that once young people are housed, they are often more food secure, so they're able to spend it on food that is more nourishing um, rather than um, what they typically have been receiving. Um, and so again, allowing for this flexibility um, allows young people to make the best decision they can in a place that is safest for them rather than have it go to the landlord. Senator Aki. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Each answer creates another question because I just had heard previously that the amount of the stipend was related to the cost of housing, which would be what they would need to maintain housing, but now I'm hearing that it could be for basic needs, saving and all these things. How are they paying for their housing if that amount is the cost of their housing? So they can't do both. Ms. Berger Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. It's a great question. So the flexibility of the cash, again, allows young people, if they would like to use that total amount for rent, that's what we put it for a, rent, a rental share. So it's not for a full one bedroom, but it's for a share, because young people have said that often they do have shared housing. And so again, if um, a young person decides to use a portion of that because rent is less than $1,000, then there's, then there's an amount that would allow them to meet other basic needs. I think like all of us, when we receive a paycheck, some of it goes towards rent or a mortgage, but then there's always, and we, choose, we make ch housing choices um, that allow us to have that flexibility knowing that there's other cash that, that for, to meeting other basic needs. Senator Thank Utke. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it it kind of goes, being we're targeting rent, that's, we're still not quite on the same page, but uh, that's, that's good for now, so I thank you. Members, other questions? Sen Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and, and I appreciate the concern for homeless youth. I've personally been involved in a couple projects out my way, um, and I appreciate the idea of your project. Um, you know, if you have, I just, I think it's under-designed and I don't think it's gonna get you the benefit you think. Um, you talked about a cliff, you got a 24 month cliff. Um, you know, the, the criteria about rewarding it, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a nice idea and it's, it's a theory. Will this make a difference? You're trying to test the theory, but you don't have any impetus toward making sure they go to a good number of these individuals have uh, mental illness challenges. If you assure that by getting the stipend they promise to go to their appointments uh, with the clinician that they're working with, if they promise to try to find uh, a work environment where they could, there, there's so many uh, tasks available for entry level workers in the long term care industry in both these counties, um, that you could assure that they would work that direction. I've tried a lot in the past with um, unsuccessfully to uh, have shelters and these emergency services, uh, you know, steer people into uh, habits that will create stability and, and help them to escape the, the traps they're in and with, with no fault ascribed to how they got there. There's this, I mean, we don't have to debate that again, but, um, and at the end, I don't get to decide, but um, if I, if this doesn't work out, I would suggest you Someone mentioned philanthropy. This would be a great project for the Wilder Foundation or somebody to put the three million in for a project and then come back and look what happened. Um, as, and, and so the criteria are they have to be living somewhere and have a few minor criteria. Um, and so, I don't know, good luck, but I'm just, if you want it to work, I think you want to do some engineering. Thank you. Um, Senator McEwen, any? comments or? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I appreciate the, the conversation, Senator Abler. I, I would like my experts to have an opportunity to respond if they, if they do have any response to the, the comments. Ms. Snyder? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I would say one thing um, about the way that we structure housing um, for young people, oftentimes with the federal and state housing, LITC and credits such as that, it precludes young people from going to school full time, it precludes people from working, and that traps young people, and they are not able to go on to work, they're not able to go on to school, and particularly for young people who really dream of big things, they, they do end up suffering mentally because of that. And um, the housing way that we've designed it for adults doesn't really work for young people. And I agree with you that that causes depression, it causes anxiety. And I think that's one of the reasons why the direct cash transfer solves for that is because it gets them out of housing that blocks them from working, it blocks them from going to school, um, and really allows them to launch. Um, because a lot of the housing that we have currently does not allow them to do that. 
Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? This bill, uh, we will be laying it over, and we will, um, if any other questions come up, we'll, we'll talk about it some more. But I appreciate um, all the testimony, and I appreciate the, the research focus. Um, I do think that what I've read about, you know, providing a consistent, um, stable approach over a um, longer period of time with certainty, it, it does seem to have some benefits for, um, for people who are trying to um, get to a different level of stability. So anyway, thank you for the presentation and um, the bill, um, Senate file 1903 is laid over. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Senate file 30. And I see there's a, an amendment. I know you've been to multiple com or other committees prior to this. Do you want to describe, is it your amendment? And would you like to describe and? Madam Chair, I'm a co-author. I'll move the amendment. Thank you. Senator Abler moves the A13 amendment. I'll let you get Thank you. Thank you, Madam you Chair. <laughs> Tell us Switching about the gears amendment. here. Yep. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this, this amendment, amendment um, just uh, is making a, a sort of a technical change to make sure that we're including um, and correctly defining all of the different um, entities that would be able to apply for and receive um, assistance under the, uh, this program to make sure that we can replace all the lead pipes. Uh, members, any other questions about the amendment? Um, Senator Abler moves the A13. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amend amendment is adopted. Um, to your bill, Senator McEwen, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am very pleased to present Senate File 30, a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead in their drinking water through lead service lines. Members, this is fundamentally a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead. If there's one takeaway I want all of us to walk away with today, it is that no amount of exposure to lead is safe. Lead service lines are one of the largest lead sources in Minnesotans' drinking water. Often, lead service lines are both publicly and privately owned, and both parts of the line must be replaced simultaneously to avoid increasing lead concentration in drinking water. So this is a, a task. Uh, lead exposure through drinking water is also a statewide issue. Lead service lines are present across Minnesota in all communities, urban, suburban, and rural. Lead exposure through service lines is most common in lower income communities. Many cities and townships do not have a comprehensive map of their lead lines. This bill is critical, not only for the health and safety of our constituents and their drinking water, but it is critical that we pass this bill now to maximize federal funding provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law Congress passed in 2021 and to provide the assistance Minnesota communities need to be in compliance with the federal law. So um, this is how Senate File 30 works. It establishes eligible recipients and uses of grants to replace the lead service lines. So eligible recipients of grant funds will include community public water suppliers of a community water system, municipalities, suppliers of other residential drinking water systems, and any applicant eligible for loans and grants under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. Eligible uses of grant funding will include removing and replacing lead water lines, construction related to the removal and replacement, providing information to residents on the benefits of removing lead lines, and repaying debt incurred for those above uses. Grant money can be used to pay for 100% of the cost of replacing privately owned lead lines, and only 50% of those lines that are publicly owned. The bill also promotes planning by grant recipients. That's a big part of what this is. In particular, it states that the Public Facilities Authority must give priority to cities, local water systems, and other applicants that use grant proceeds as part of a plan to remove all lead lines in their jurisdiction. Uh, 
Senate File 30 states that a plan should include the following. How the recipient will maximize the number of participating property owners with portions of lead water lines that are privately owned, including in low income and disadvantaged communities. How the recipient will maximize the efficient use of funds by coordinating the replacement of privately owned and publicly owned portions of the lead lines together. How the recipient will minimize the partial replacement of lead lines and how equity for disadvantaged groups is prioritized in their plan. Further, the bill requires that grant applicants that have at least 50,000 water connections must submit a workforce plan as part of their application that describes how the applicant will maximize the use of registered apprentices and workers from communities that are underrepresented in the construction industry. Um, like most construction and building projects funded with state or federal dollars, the bill also requires that the laborers and mechanics who work to remove and replace lead water lines must be paid the appropriate prevailing wage. Also, like many bills that create a new program, Senate File 30 requires a report each year from the Public Facilities Authority to the legislature on the operation of the grant program and how it's working. Um, with that, Madam Chair, um, I would like to proceed to testimony. I have a couple of testifiers, and I also have um, someone here from the Minnesota Department of Health to just speak very briefly about lead. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Um, we have one testifier listed on Zoom, Andrew Slade. If you can please state your name and begin your testimony. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is Andrew Slate. I'm the Great Lakes Program Director for Minnesota Environmental Partnership. I reside in Morris Township outside of Ely, Minnesota, and for the previous 30 years, I lived and raised my family in Duluth. Wish, I'd like to wish a happy St. Erho's Day to all, all who celebrate. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate remotely in this hearing. Uh, please note that MEP, Minnesota Environmental Partnership, submitted a letter supporting S. B30, which is signed by 20 of our member organizations. I want to share with you why lead service line replacement is so urgent. We strongly support this bill. Lead poisoning is real and it's happening now to children in Duluth. MEP worked with community advocates to run an informal citizen water testing program in Duluth. Working friend to friend and neighbor to neighbor, we tested 53 homes, primarily in older single family homes in diverse Duluth neighborhoods. Two out of every three of those homes had detectable lead in their drinking water, and 13% of those homes had lead exceeding the federal action level. Fortunately, we were able to pro provide these families with drinking water filters and explain how to run their water before using it in the morning to mitigate the presence of lead. We shared our results with the city of Duluth, which did its own testing program. Their results showed an even higher level of lead. I'd love to share a, a map with you, uh, and hopefully I can somehow uh, very recently, the Minnesota Department of Health updated their map showing the actual levels of lead in infants' blood. This is where the, the, the it's not just the, in the drinking water. The status show that it's also in the infants' blood. They found in Duluth Central Hillside neighborhood a frighteningly high percentage of infants with elevated blood lead levels. One of every ten children tested in certain neighborhoods in Duluth. Uh, and to see that, see that right within four four blocks of, of Lake Superior, where the drinking water comes from, is, is, is frightening indeed. Uh, we've shared our results with our congressional delegation, and we're very pleased to see the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act provide dramatic increases in funding and more aggressive lead line replacement policies. We believe at MEP that we can replace all the lead service lines in Minnesota within 10 years. Seeing the recent data about Duluth Central Hillside and the one out of 10 infants tells us it's urgent to speed up and get these lines replaced to avoid contaminating another generation with lead through their drinking water. While federal dollars have been and will be helpful, the federal dollars are not sufficient. The problem is so widespread that the state needs to step in and help. In summary, if we only use federal or municipal dollars, we won't be able to comprehensively or quickly solve the problem. This bill puts us on a path to comprehensively solve the problem in all Minnesota communities before we lose more kids' futures to the lead poisoning. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we have in person uh, Patrick Shea and John Thorson. Um, please state your name for the record and, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good mo morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Patrick Shea. I'm the general manager of St. Paul Regional Water Services. 
thank you for allowing me uh, the opportunity to testify in favor of Senate File 30. We at St. Paul Regional Water Services are a regional utility providing water to over 450,000 Minnesota reverend residents and are governed by the Board of Water Commissioners. Our water system consists of nearly 100,000 service lines. Nearly 26,000 of these lines contain some portion of lead. These assets are not entirely publicly owned, yet the result of ignoring them comes at a great public cost. Providing safe and reliable drinking water is not just a goal for St. Paul Regional Water Services, but a mission, and lead in drinking water is a serious health concern. In March of 2022, the St. Paul Board of Water Commissioners directed staff to develop a 10-year lead service line replacement project. This project is now termed lead-free SPRWS. With help from American Rescue Plan dollars from the City of St. Paul and a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health, we were able to successfully develop the lead-free SPRWS program over this past year. We have worked out numerous roadblocks and are only lacking funding for this 10-year initiative to reach its final goal. Without additional state and federal dollars, we will fall well short of removing all lead service lines over the next decade. It is for this reason that we at St. Paul Regional Water Services strongly support this bill and believe it is imperative that Minnesota makes the necessary investments to ensure lead service lines are eliminated over the next decade. We at SPRWS are available to answer any questions related to lead service lines, lead service line replacement, and suggestions that you may have uh, to help make this initiative successful. I want to extend a thank you to Sen Senator McEwen and for her leadership and that of this committee for the consideration of this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Thorson, please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is John Thorson. I'm the Legislative Director for Lyuna, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union, representing more than 13,000 skilled construction laborers uh, who build and maintain our roads, highways, bridges, and the basic utilities that allow our communities to thrive. We're proud to stand with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, Conservation Minnesota, the Operating Engineers, Local 49, and the St. Paul Regional Water Services in seeking a transformational investment in our state's future uh, that puts us on a path to remove what the Department of Revenue, or I'm sorry, the Department of Health estimates to be over uh, 100,000 lead service lines in communities throughout our state. We strongly support the provisions of Senate File 30 that call for eliminating all lead service lines by 2033 and provide the funding necessary to ensure that cities can map, identify, and replace lead pipes both in the public right-of-way and the 70% of lines uh, on private property. As uh, Senator McEwen stated, uh, there is no safe level of exposure to lead uh, with infants and children up to six uh, facing the highest risks of lead exposure because their bodies are still rapidly developing. They're more susceptible to damage to their brain and nervous system, slowed growth and development, learning and behavior problems. Uh, Minnesotans living in older houses, especially those constructed before 1945, are at greater risk of having lead service lines between the city main and their home. And historically, uh, the lead was used because it was less expensive than iron, could be more easily bent around existing structures without leaking, and allowed more durable uh, connections to stiffer pipes that expand and contract with temperature. Uh, LIUNA members are skilled in lead service line replacement, and we've worked with cities all throughout the nation to accelerate the identification and removal of lead pipes in communities. And here in Minnesota, it's estimated that removal and replacement of lead service pipes will create and maintain around 2,400 jobs annually over the next 10 years. We're very excited about the career and economic inclusion opportunities this brings to, Minnesotan, uh, to Minnesota's construction industry through registered apprenticeship programs that increase participation of women, people of color, veterans, and others not yet fully participating in the economy to their full potential. Uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank uh, Senator McEwen for bringing this proposal forward and encourage members of the committee to support Senate File 30 as uh, these critical state investments uh, ensure that lead pipes are replaced, clean drinking water is delivered to families and children across Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, I have Sheila Lal on the list. Is she present? She, um, she is 
And oh yeah, she's not on the Zoom. Okay. And then you had someone from the Department of Health that was going to present. Yes. Welcome Hi. to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Stephanie Yendel, and I am the supervisor of the Blood Lead Surveillance Program at the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm, thank you. Uh, as you've heard from some of the other testifiers, uh, children are at the greatest risk for exposure to lead. Um, this is because of um, both the fact that their bodies uh, absorb more of the lead that they ingest, as well as because they are um, rapidly growing and uh, their brains are developing. There is no level of lead that has been determined to be safe. Um, and lead does impact learning and behavior and therefore can have uh, long-term ramifications for children who are exposed. Lead does affect people of all ages, um, so it, it um, affects adults as well. It can cause um, health effects such as memory loss and hypertension, uh, infertility. Um, again, we do see the greatest effects uh, for children and pregnant women. Um, unfortunately, though, um, at the time that they are exposed, many individuals uh, who have elevated blood lead levels don't show any signs or symptoms um, at that moment. So especially for young children, if they're exposed at age one or two, we may not see the effects of that exposure uh, until they enter the school system and are struggling uh, with learning. Um, again, lead does decrease IQ, and there is no threshold at which these uh, decreases in IQ begin. Um, and children affects, or lead affects children across all of Minnesota. Uh, there are, however, particular neighborhoods that um, have greater concentrations of children that are affected by lead, um, particularly because of um, the, the patterns uh, where our housing has been built. Um, you can see that in the Twin Cities, um, there are neighborhoods across, um, in particular, St. Paul and Minneapolis that have greater levels of exposure to lead. Uh, we see these same patterns across the state with um, concentrated of areas where children do have greater levels of exposure. For children that do have higher levels of exposure to lead, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health, as well as several of our local partners, conduct in-home investigation to de determine the sources of that lead exposure. Uh, we most commonly find chipping and peeling paint as the source of exposure for children with the highest levels of exposure to lead. Um, however, there are a number of other sources of exposure that we do detect, such as um, spices, pottery, uh, exposure from jewelry, keys, toys, and lead dust brought home from a parent's job or hobby. Uh, however, water um, really presents an opportunity for reducing the baseline exposure of lead, um, baseline exposure to lead for people across um, wide geographic areas. And so replacing lead service lines um, does present us with a primary prevention opportunity um, for eliminating lead exposure before it begins. Uh, there's two main sources of lead that do occur in water. Uh, the first is lead service lines, and the other is premise plumbing. Um, you can see from the diagram here that uh, there are different components to the lead service line, um, and that adds about half of the lead that is present in drinking, drinking water when those are present. Um, and the, the best estimate is that there are about 100,000 uh, lead service lines in Minnesota. Uh, however, as you've heard, we lack a full inventory. Um, and lead service lines are often shared between public and private ownership. Um, and then it's also important to note that lead can also be found in schools and child care facilities um, because of lead solder, uh, brass parts, um, as well as um, areas where lead can collect, such as faucet aerators. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about lead exposure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Members, do you have any questions about the bill? No. Do you have Senator Atkey? Not really a question, but a, a, maybe a comment, uh, Madam Chair, and for you in particular because of the size of this and if they're looking at health, that's a budget buster. Um, something like this should be probably 
better placed at uh, capital investments where it goes into a PFA account or something that typically um, works with the uh, infrastructure of water and sewer? Just, just a thought because uh, those numbers are quite large. They are, um, Senator Atkey, and the bill um, will be moved on to finance and will be carried. And Senator McEwen, maybe you can address how the how you understand the, the financing to work. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Atkey. Yes, this is um, this is a big project, and um, you know, frankly, as a new legislator coming in over just the past couple of years, you know, I wish that my predecessors would have taken this up 10, 20 years ago. I've been living in a home with um, lead service lines my whole life up in Duluth, and my parents knew this was a problem um, years and years ago. So, um, so yeah, we. But it's something that has um, been neglected by our by our state government. This is a public problem. It needs a public fix. As we said, we can't do this um, piecemeal, and we actually can make the problem worse if we start replacing the public lines without a program in place that will also allow for the replacement of the private portion. So in regard to the financing, yes, we're going to go to the Finance Committee. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about um, the way that this is going to be done. There's discussions happening between the House, between the administration, but there is commitment to making this happen. Um, as I said, it's it's long, long overdue. Senator Atkey, any other questions? No? Members, any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Senator McEwen, for your presentation. And um, Senator Mann, would you make the motion to recommend that um, Senate File 30, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance? Members on the question, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. Senate file 30 as amended um, is passed and referred to the Committee on Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. And now we're going to take, um, we're going to go out of order and just, I'll present my <laughs> bill and then Senator Morrison has two bills to present. So. We'll do this Senate file um, 2588. <laughs> Madam Chair, do your bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate file 2588 relates to uh, establishing requirements um, for the Commissioner of Health to administer lifeline centers, and this has to do with the 988 um, Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicide, suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the country. The Lifeline is comprised of a national network of over 200 local crisis centers across the U.S. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline's new three-digit number launched last July, transitioning the former 1-800-273-TALK uh, phone number. The new number is intended to be easy to remember, similar to how people can dial 911 for medical emergencies. Since that transi transition, about 2.1 million calls, texts, and chats to the new 988 number have been routed to response centers across the country. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people and the 10th leading cause of death overall. Every year in the U.S., more people die by suicide than in car accidents. For every one person who dies by suicide, 316 people seriously consider suicide but do not kill themselves. 777 Minnesotans died by suicide in 2021. 
Given that number, there were likely more than 245,000 Minnesotans who seriously considered suicide in 2021. Since switching to 988 on July 16th, calls to Minnesota's four call centers have increased 44%. Minnesota has also seen a, an 173% increase in web chats since January of 2022, and 250% increase in text to 988. Crises are typically de-escalated on the call, with less than 2% of lifeline calls engaging emergency services or mobile crisis response. However, it is critical that calls to 988 from Minnesotans be answered in our own state so that connections to local resources and mobile crisis response can be made as needed. We've worked hard and invested in building out our mobile crisis system in Minnesota, but a person who needs that level of response won't get it if their call is answered in another state. Short-term federal funding has helped our 988 Lifeline Centers in Minnesota build capacity to meet the increased need and answer a much higher number of calls in-state. The in-state answer rate nearly doubled in between 2021 and 2022 from just 43% in 2021 to 83% in 2022. However, this is not ongoing funding and there is a need to create a stable and sustainable funding model to support the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline in Minnesota long-term. Senate File 2588 creates that funding model with a small telecom fee for landline and cell phones. The proposed fee would be not lower than 12 cents per month and no higher than 25 cents per month, and would be used to create and maintain a statewide 988 suicide prevention crisis system. It also draws an investment from the current budget surplus to allow our lifeline centers to continue to build capacity in the, in the first couple years as the telecom fees are established and collection begins. Our lifeline centers have made great progress in expanding to meet need, and we don't want to lose ground or revert back to having a large number of calls from Minnesota answered outside our state. Um, at this point, I'd, I'd like to have my testifier, um, Shanna Mulvihill, if she could come up and... Ms. Mulvihill, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning. Thank you. Shanna Mulvihill, Executive Director of Mental Health Minnesota and Co-Chair of the Mental Health Legislative Network. Uh, first, I'd like to... Um, express the Mental Health Legislative Network's support of the proposed bill to provide sustainable funding for 988 response. This is one of a number of bills that we're working on to move forward as a network this year to build capacity within our mental health system. And the network has long recognized the importance of building a comprehensive mental health system in our state, and access to crisis services is certainly a key part of meeting that need. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, of course, helps people across Minnesota who are struggling and provides an upstream level of help that is a crucial part of the continuum of mental health services in our state. I know this because I've taken those calls. I completed my master's degree a decade ago and completed my clinical work for my degree answering calls at 988, which was then, of course, known as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I logged more than 700 hours on the phone, taking hundreds of calls. Calls at two in the afternoon and calls at three in the morning because when you're an intern, you get the overnight shifts. Calls from people who are struggling with difficult symptoms of their illness, isolation, and suicidal thoughts. Calls from people who had never struggled with their mental health before, but a recent event had them reeling, and suddenly seriously wondering whether their family and the world in general would be better off without them. And there are calls I still think about even years later. The call from a farmer in southwestern Minnesota who was struggling with symptoms of depression and anxiety, but didn't feel like he could talk about it with family or friends. The call from a woman who needed someone on the phone with her while she climbed up to her highest kitchen cabinet. That was where she stored her bottle of sleeping pills that night so she wouldn't take them all. The call from a woman who called in significant distress because she heard children crying for help outside her door, but when she opened it, no one was there. In that moment, I was her tether to reality and could offer empathy and comfort as she struggled to determine what was real and what was not. 
The call from a young man on his cell phone standing on a bridge who told me he wanted to end his life. I spent nearly two hours on the phone with him that day, eventually able to get emergency personnel out to him to get him the help he needed. I could have been the last phone call he ever made. It's 10 years later, I still get a little. Um, I'm thankful he wasn't. Um, and he called back actually several weeks later to thank us. Around half of suicides in Minnesota are completed by those who have no known history of mental illness or treatment. These are not people who are connected in with a therapist and a support network, and an easy to remember and well publicized phone number that provides a source of help in a given moment of need can and does save lives. The National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020, which is, the, of course, the federal legislation that designated 988 as the three-digit number for mental health and suicidal crises, allows states to use the 988V for crisis center operations and related services. The broad allowable use of these fees reflects reality. Our mental health system across the country is far behind any emergency response to a physical health condition, and we need to address mental health crisis with the appropriate expertise and resources. Minnesota has a system to address physical health emergencies, 911, ambulance services, and emergency departments. The 988 service fees in this bill will help establish an equitable system to address mental health emergencies and parallel services, including 988 call centers, to ensure that an equitable and appropriate response for mental health crisis is available across the state. In the past, the state has made only a fairly minimal investment in the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline, and while we do have additional federal funding that has come in, that is temporary and still not enough. While we do seek funding from the current surplus to help continue to build that capacity for the 988 system, we can't depend on a current budget surplus to sustain this work moving forward. Building capacity for the state's 988 Lifeline Centers by initiating a telecom fee is a critical step toward addressing mental health crisis response needs in Minnesota and reducing the engagement of 911 response and law enforcement in mental health crises. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your critically important work and thank you for caring so deeply about other people. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Uh, Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, hopefully, I had to step out for a minute, so hopefully this isn't repetitive. The, in, on page four where it talks about it could be 12 cents to 25 cents per month, um, have we narrowed that down um, to a point where we know what we're targeting at this point? Um, Senator, or Madam Chair, um, Senator Rutke, I, I believe that there is a range. I don't know if you wish to speak to the, the range. Um, the governor also has a proposal with a, a set amount in it, and so uh, we plan to lay the bill over and then discuss some of the, some more of those details, but maybe Ms. Mulvihill will, has more of a response. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Madam Chair, Senator, um, the, um, the fee range, um, we has a, a floor of 12 cents. That's where we anticipate starting. That brings in about $9.8 million um, that we expect is what we need to um, meet the capacity needed uh, for our lifeline centers. Um, the range um, is um, reflective of being similar to a kind of a ceiling that's in legislation for, for other similar fees like 911. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it, you, you re think you just referenced 911, the fees and stuff that we pay, and of course they are quite a bit more than what you're projecting. But you're going to, I would, and I didn't catch quite everything. Uh, these mics don't do the greatest job, uh, and I don't always hear everything that's said. But um, you've got a targeted amount, and you'll know how many phones are out there. That's how you'll kind of work it backwards to be able to. Um, project your, your income so that you can make this thing go. Is that correct? The, the plan is, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Madam Chair, Senator, um, the plan would be to begin with the 12 cent, the floor okay. fee, um, to raise that $9.8 million. Um, and the 25, and then the, the range is to allow for meeting 
increased need as we deem that to be necessary. Okay. Senator Rocky. Thank you very much. I just missed that part with mm -hmm. the floor, so that was my fault. So, But anyhow, thank you. Other questions? Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And uh, actually, no one's talked to me about this. I don't know if there's people who are loving it or not liking the fee part. I, I certainly agree with the need. And then the question is, how do you pay for it? And that's the forever dilemma. And um, I think if I, I mean, there's $19 billion of surplus when you add the inflation back in. And I'm not sure that people are expecting us to raise their fees in a time like this. So that's my, my, my just thought off the top of my head. Um, and, and nobody ran on raising fees, I don't think. But um, so in section three on line 5.24, um, <coughs> Is that, I don't understand, so what, so you're going to discharge every phone this 12 or 25 cent fee, or, um, and then what retail transactions is that on line 5.26 and 27? Is that when you buy a phone or something, or? Um, Madam Chair, Senator, that's correct. So there, it, and not, the 911 fee is charged the same way um, that is charged uh, when you buy a phone as well as as a monthly fee on your bill. I believe Minnesota right now is at 84 cents. Senator Abler. All right, well, thanks. Um, and then just the last question. Um, so when it goes from, things always hit the top. So you just... As a lawmaker, I'm like, oh, it could be like on the paid family leave thing. It's 0.7 to 1.2. It's going to be 1.2. We just have to kind of expect that. The minsure fee is only 2%. It could be 3.5. It's at 3.5, etc. So, who decides it's going to go up to the max? Miss um, Mulvihill. And also, I, I do not expect that to be at 1.2. So. Oh, <laughs> well, that's funny. Thank you. Appreciate your faith, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, Senator, um, there, there is a report required um, annually by the commissioner to um, provide information about how the, that fee was spent. And so I would expect at that time there would be information coming around any need to increase the existing fee based on increased need that is not being met by the current, um, right. the current budget. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. So there's a report. We need more money. Is that just... Does, is this the Commissioner of Health, and do they just do it automatically, or is there, do they have to go through rulemaking or a public hearing process or something, do you know? I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, Senator, I'm, I'm afraid I can't speak to that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, um, right. but I'm, I'd be happy to talk with the department about more clarity around that and get back yeah, to you. I, I just think we should know. Um, <coughs> Senator? I'm going to hold you to that uh, 1.2 <laughs> thing, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, with that, we will be laying over Senate File 2588. Thank you, Senator. If you have any closing comments. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to make uh, just one other comment about the, the fees and the collection and the language. Um, I think we should look into that question you had, Senator Abler, about how the, the fees might increase. And then um, I just I, I wanted to acknowledge that I, I did speak with the, the mobile uh, phone carriers and the telecom um, uh, lobbyists and um, they ha have some questions about just making sure that we have the right language about um, accountability for use of the funds that that mirrors um, what is in place for the 911 funds so I will continue to discuss that with them and make sure that we um, that we work out that the details on that before we move the bill forward thank you senator Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I appreciate the time to be able to present the bill. So, thank you. Thank you Senator Morrison, you're presenting Senate File 579, which is Senator McQuaid's bill, and she 
um, is not able to be here today. So please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I am presenting Senate File 579 in Senator Makeway's absence, although I am a proud co-author. Um, I think we can all agree that the water our students drink at school should be safe and free of lead. Back to lead. <laughs> After all, by the time most of our kids graduate from high school, they will have spent more than 15,000 hours at school. Since the crisis in Flint, Michigan, we've seen greater recognition of the danger of lead in our water. States are taking steps to test, mitigate, and address what is pervasive, what is a pervasive problem for buildings that were built in the 1980s or before. But the reality is with the availability of newer health data and considering what other states are doing in this arena, we can do better. Children are most vulnerable to the damaging effects of lead because their bodies are still developing and absorb more of the harmful metal than adults. And we know from national data that this is a pervasive problem in our schools. This bill seeks to take the steps necessary to ensure we get the lead out of drinking water of every school in this state. This is a realistic and achievable goal, but only if we work together to take this problem more seriously. Currently, Minnesota schools are testing for lead and working in partnership with MDH and MDE on mitigation strategies. However, we don't really have a complete picture of the challenge because there's not any centralized reporting. In addition, the schools that have been testing are mitigating when levels of lead are 15 parts per billion or higher. This is not a health-based standard as there is no safe level for lead. But as I'll talk about, there is better health-based evidence available to us now to inform a different level and other states we can look to for guidance as well. The other challenge is that it can be costly for schools to conduct testing and then do the remediation. It's not often as costly as a lead service line replacement, but things like fixtures and plumbing fittings that need to be replaced can add up. It's particularly a challenge for rural school districts that don't have as large of a levy or tax a property tax base or school districts that have many aging buildings. This bill attempts to address these gaps in our current system in several ways. Centralized reporting so that policymakers can get a better handle on the state of this issue. A national survey of school districts found that 37% of districts that tested for lead came back with elevated levels. How does that track with Minnesota? The answer is we have no idea, which is why we need better reporting. We're move we are moving the threshold for for remediation from 15 parts per billion to five parts per billion. Again, there is no safe level of lead. But newer research found harm from consumer water with levels above five parts per billion. Of note, this is the maximum amount of lead contamination the US, US FDA allows for bottled water. It's also the direction more states are moving. If we're asking districts to mitigate, we believe state funding is appropriate. This bill includes a funding source through long-term facilities maintenance revenue so that schools are appropriately, appropriately compensated for remediation. Lastly, I just want to thank the Department of Health, the Department of Education, and representatives with Minnesota school districts for their partnership and communication in drafting this bill. Uh, we're in communication regularly to ensure this bill meets its public policy objectives and is something we will work from an administrative basis for all parties. This is a strong, common sense bill to move us toward a direction that all of us should agree is an ultimate goal, getting lead out of school drinking water. Last year it passed this committee on a unanimous basis, and I think again it's something we can support on a bipartisan basis in the best interests of the health of our kids. Thank you, Senator Morrison. And just so uh, members are aware, this bill was heard in education policy um, and, and then was <clears throat> passed out to us. But after this, we will be passing it back to education finance. So um, we do have a testifier who is, um, let's see, in person, Steve, Stephen Ring. Oh, I'm sorry, he, he is on Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Steve, <clears throat> Stephen Ring, and I'm here as a volunteer on behalf of the Sierra Club North Star Chapter. I'm the chair of their Waters and Wetlands Stewards. I also worked for more than 30 years at the Minnesota Department of Health, much of that time in the public health laboratory doing lab analyses of probable toxins and pollutants. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of Senate File 579. 
I want to thank the legislature for passing the school ed protection bill in 2018. That was a big step forward and it is the foundation for Senate File 579. A major provision of this bill is a stricter, more definitive standard for lead exposure. This is appropriate because it is now clear that there's no safe level for lead. Lead damage is permanent and children are especially susceptible. So preventing the exposure in the first place is critical. Virtually every agency, academy and nation that regulates lead concentrations in drinking water has reduced its earlier recommended control levels. Many now advocate for the five parts per billion standards that this bill requires. The Food and Drug Administration requires bottled water to meet the five parts per billion standard. The 2018 Minnesota law required public reporting of lead testing results, but there was no standard format and no central repository for the information. The inclusion of those provisions in this bill will have a huge benefit for protecting Minnesota kids. Reliable data will allow us to track trends, identify problems, and to understand how well Minnesota is addressing the school lead problem. Of particular concern, elevated lead concentrations have been associated with low income communities, both urban and rural. We agree that it is crucial that funding be directly attached to this bill to support schools to remediate to the lowest possible lead levels. We want schools to recognize that they will have support for addressing this issue. We strongly urge you to support Senate File 579, and I thank you again for the opportunity to speak to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions about the bill? Senator Adkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And school districts were mentioned early on um, because it, it, of course, affects schools. Did, did they respond favorably? Because the question, I, or what, as I read this, and I was trying to find the answer to in here, and I, I didn't as of yet, is there's costs and there's mandates to the schools. Have, are they acceptable to that, or do they have concerns? Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Aki, my understanding is yes, that they are in, they've, I know that the author has worked closely with MDE. I don't know if there's anyone from MDE here who could respond further, but that is my understanding. Someone has come forward um, who may be able to answer the question. Okay. Please state your name and, and, and go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Josh Downham with the Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, Senator Utke, um, Sam Walseth from the Rural Education Association and also the service cooperatives and I have been working with the, the authors of this bill and uh, we support it. It uh, has come a long way, frankly, in the last two years. Um, it's the right thing to do, uh, but the, the inclusion of the long-term facilities maintenance aid is key, frankly, to uh, ensuring that we can actually meet these standards. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, because that was that was the one thing I was trying to figure out as I was looking through here. And I guess I haven't said it before. We've had a number of lead bills, and we want to remove all the excess lead we can. But at the same time, lead is a natural reoccurring product. So I was sharing some of the stuff I had found on the EPA sites here just recently. Um, and we've done a great job since back in the 70s to where we are today. That level is extremely low. Uh, but we know there's still pockets of stuff that we can do better. And, you know, we've heard about those in earlier uh, um, bills here too. So um, with that, I, but that was just a comment on the lead. But uh, the main thing is I wanted to know where the school district stood because uh, they do talk to us quite frequently about the stuff we keep piling on their plate, <laughs> known as mandates. So thank you. Members, any other questions? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and we were in the, I was in the education policy hearing, and that's, it's, it's come a long ways, and um, that's good news, too, and that is just bad. Uh, to actually talk to me, uh, on line 3.11 to 15, the, the schools are supposed to report to the Commissioner of Health, and then they're supposed to post that. Uh, the good news, Madam Chair, for this bill is that education people have to pay for it, but 
Uh, is the Department of Health going to ascribe a cost to this uh, minor duty that they're required to do? Um, Senator Morrison, I don't know. Do you? I see Ms. Timian is uh, nodding. Do her you head. have an... For free? Not for free. There we go. It's, it's easy. It's almost nothing. We will uh, let the department... Part. Madam Morrison Chair, our in, intrepid Department of Health yes. will... Ms. Timian, please um, state your name. And Hi, good morning. For the record, Lisa Timian, Department of Health. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, we are working on a fiscal note. I cannot recall if it's been completed or if it's what the status is, but yes, we do expect there to be cost to us, and we will have that reflected in a fiscal note. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. You know, in honor of the child care world, I just suggest you to think small. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Abler. Any other questions? Um, Senator Morrison, any final comments? Or? Madam Chair, if there is no safe love, love led. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so your motion um, today would be that Senate file number 579 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Is that your motion? Madam Chair, that is my motion. Thank you. All members... Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. The Senate file 579 is passed and referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Now you are uh, ready to present Senate file 168. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members of the committee, the bill before you, Senate File 168, would stop price gouging of prescription drugs and establish a prescription drug affordability board to give the state the ability to limit how much residents must pay for certain high-cost drugs. This is an issue we've all heard about from our constituents. While action has been taken to increase drug price transparency and establish an emergency insulin program in Minnesota, the costs of prescription drugs continue to skyrocket in the United States. These high prices make it difficult for Minnesotans to afford the medicine they need. Prescription drug price gouging drives up health care costs in the entire system and impacts public health, which we all pay for. This policy prohibits price gouging of generic, generic prescription drugs and establishes a prescription drug affordability board, similar to those that have now been established in six other states, Maryland, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Maine, and New Hampshire. A few recent examples of skyrocketing drug prices, Madam Chair and members. According to a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association last summer, between 2008 and 2021, median launch prices increased from $2,115 per year to $180,007. The proportion of drugs priced at $150,000 per year increased from 9% to 47%. Even older drugs that have been on the market for a long time are not immune. The cost of insulin tripled between 2002 and 2013, despite no notable changes in the formulation. And the three largest price increases reported to Oregon's prescription drug price transparency program in 2022 were for generics. Clearly, more has to be done to address the high cost of prescription drugs and price gouging. I'll give a brief overview of the bill. The bill prohibits unnecessary and excessive price increases on generic and off-brand drugs and enables our state attorney general to investigate and act when such price hikes occur. The AG can require the manufacturer to repay consumers directly, deposit excess profits in a fund dedicated to drug affordability, and impose financial penalties. The Prescription Drug Affordability Board established by this bill is an independent body with statewide authority to evaluate high-cost drugs and set an upper payment limit when a drug's cost is excessive and prevents an affordability challenge for patients or other payers, including the state. When the board sets an upper price limit, it applies to all in-state charges and payer reimbursements for a particular drug, helping consumers, state and local governments, health plan companies, providers, pharmacies, and other stakeholders to manage the challenge of escalating drug prices. This affordability board has two long-standing precedents, healthcare rate setting and public service commissions. States regulate insurers and other public goods, such as gas, electric, and telecommunications in markets with little or no market competition. And determining upper payment levels for healthcare and other public goods is a state practice that has existed for decades. 
Upper payment limits build on the standard operating procedures of the existing supply chain, where manufacturers routinely adjust their price concessions through negotiations with providers or the supply chain when payer reimbursement does not cover the list price. Uh, we did take uh, a, an amendment in its last committee stop that I think improved the bill, and I just want to share some of that. Uh, the seven-member board uh, is appointed by the governor with non-voting members of the House and Senate um, who must have relevant experience in drug pricing with no conflicts of interest. The bill also establishes an advisory council to provide advice to the board since drug costs involve and affect numerous stakeholders. The advisory council includes drug industry representatives, employers, health plan companies, providers, researchers, consumer advocates, and state government. The legislation builds off the prescription drug price transparency law we passed in 2020, utilizing information reported through transparency rather than requiring additional reporting. Uh, the amendment that we adopted also updated the bill in line with learnings from other states that have begun to implement their boards, including adjusting several thresholds to reflect the relevant costs of drugs now and ensure the board is not overburdened with reviews of drugs. It builds on the Inflation Reduction Act, allowing the board to adopt any Medicare negotiated rates as upper payment limits for Minnesota rather than having to duplicate that work. And it ensures the board has access to the expertise and data available through the Department of Health rather than having to duplicate that. It also changed all voting board members to be appointed by the governor along with two non-voting members from the legislature to ensure the separation of powers between the legislature and this board with independent administrative authority. Uh, and I think that's it, Madam Chair and members. So now I will uh, turn the floor over to the testifiers who have signed up. Thank you, uh, Senator Morrison. Uh, first we'll go to Zoom. We have two testifiers, Jessica Intermill. If you can please um, state your name uh, for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chairperson and members of the committee. My name is Jessica Intermill and I'm a proud constituent of Majority Leader Ziedzik. I come today to urge you to pass this Senate file 168. My story started over 10 years ago when I was a healthy 31 year old. My husband and I decided to have kids and four weeks into our pregnancy, something happened. First, my fingers started hurting, then my joints started swelling and every day got a little bit worse until one day I couldn't even make a fist. I was seven months pregnant when I saw my first rheumatologist, and by then my disease was so bad that he took one look at me from across the room and told me I have rheumatoid arthritis. I went home, I cried. 22 days after that, I delivered our child, and I've required care every day of the 10 years since. The closest that I can come to healthy is to inject myself with biologic medication every week. It's not a cure, there is no cure, but it has controlled my symptoms and worked to stop my disease from progressing. It allows me to be the wife, mom, neighbor, small business person and citizen that others in my community depend on. The base price for my drug is $9,282.48 per month. But even with the discounts that my insurance company negotiates, the manufacturer of this drug charges $4,405.71 per month. That's a discounted price of $150 per day for this medication every single day. And the drug company can and has raised prices over time. I'm truly grateful that I've found a medication that controls my disease, but my family needs your help. It just doesn't make sense to allow drug companies to saddle Minnesota families and companies with these outrageous costs without asking them to explain why they charge this ransom for our health. Now you may hear today from folks who will tell you that the bill will hurt patients like me by making the market anti-competitive, but that's not true. This market already lacks competition. 
my medicine is not like spaghetti. I can't just decide to buy fettuccine instead. There's not a single other manufacturer who sells this drug in the United States, so of course it gouges consumers. If I don't purchase this drug, my body will once again eat buckshot-sized holes into my bones. Inflammation will attack every one of my organs. Consumers like me can't say no to the drugs that we need to live. I can't say no to a drug that's priced four times more than my mortgage. But you can. You can say no. And that's why I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next we have Sabrina Moritz. Moritz. Again, please uh, state your name for the record and begin. Good morning, my name is Sabrina Moritz and I'm the campaign director of Take Action Minnesota. We are a statewide multiracial people's organization with over 15 years of experience working on state healthcare issues. And I'm here to support Senate file 168 and share some context about why this bill is critical. First, federal action on prescription drug costs are few and far between. We see Medicare Part D was established almost 20 years ago. And drug cost provisions in the IRA only recently passed and will only lower the cost of some medicines for some Medicare patients at some point in the next five years. When it comes to key healthcare policy, states have always done the heavy lifting that makes federal action feasible. Expansion of affordable, affordable health care and more recently pharmacy anti-gag rules and drug print price transparency leadership all came from the states and inspired the federal government. We have all paid the price of decades of inaction on drug costs, which is why SF-168 is so important. A pre prescription drug affordability board will lower prescription drug costs for patients, payers, and providers. Minnesota is well positioned to establish an effective PDAB and learn from states that are in the process of implementing boards despite industry efforts to stall. Lastly, we support SF-168 because our government has a responsibility to address the out of control costs of taxpayer funded drugs. Nearly every medicine on the market today comes from decades of publicly funded research. Our tax dollars fund everything from the research and development of treatments for rare diseases to COVID vaccines, which received over 18 billion in publicly funded research and developing and, and manufacturing. Even with the degree to which we, the taxpayers, support R&D, we're still forced to pay high costs of prescription drugs in our public health care programs and at the pharmacy. At the same time, CEOs are legally permitted to price gouge life-saving medicine while spending tens of millions of dollars on lobbying, stock buybacks, and advertising, including a full-page color ad you may have seen today in the Star Tribune. They're doing this to protect their profits, and we are asking you to protect Minnesotans. Minnesotans deserve a better deal. Prescription drugs do not work if people can't afford them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now in person, um, I'd like to call up Bentley Graves and Christina Moorhead. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, we represent more than 6,000 employers, half a million employees around the state and every corner of the state and every industry of the state. Um, we work on health care issues because of the cost considerations for our members and their employees. Um, given that, it's probably no surprise that there is a, a good bit of agreement with the goals of this bill in lowering the cost of drugs and lowering the cost of health care. Having said that, um, we do have concerns about this particular approach. Uh, you know, our members are private sector employers, businesses um, who have significant concerns about the kind of precedent that a bill like this sets with uh, an unelected commission setting prices for privately produced 
goods in a competitive market. Um, again, there's no question that, that uh, our members, uh, like most Minnesotans, would like to see more done to control and restrain the cost of health care and of drugs. Um, but on their behalf, as, again, private sector actors, we do uh, uh, come to the table today and express our concerns about this particular approach. But it is something that we've had conversations with Senator Morrison about uh, and have had those similar conversations with many of you and, and want to continue those. Uh, but this particular bill is not one that we can support, but appreciate the opportunity to provide this input today. Thank you, Mr. Graves. And now, Christina Moorhead, please state your name and, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christina Moorhead. I'm here on behalf of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma, representing the innovative biopharmaceutical research companies. So we agree with many of the testifiers here today that patients are struggling to afford or access their medicines that they need. However, we disagree that a prescription drug affordability board is the solution. So I've included in our handouts today a page of proposed policy solutions, and we'd be happy to discuss that if there's time. So an overview of uh, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board in Senate File 168 has really three actions that it does. The first is to review drug manufacturer data provided to the state as part of the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act. It then identifies prescription drugs for cost reviews. And then finally, it sets upper payment limits or prices for prescription drugs. So while these three steps sound simple in concept, there are a number of issues with this legislation that warrant discussion today. I'm going to address a few in my testimony, and we've also provided the committee with the statement that includes legal issues and other issues states have experienced with implementing similar legislation. So the Prescription Drug Review, Review Board um, is required to review prescription drug data that the Minnesota Department of Health collects as required under the Minnesota Drug Transparency Act of 2020. Last month, the MDH released their first report on the transparency data, which noted significant limitations of the data for use in analysis, including, quote, unfortunately in its current design, the act's impact is limited because one, the focus is on list price instead of net prices of drugs, and therefore does not represent the actual income manufacturers earn from the sale of their products. Two, the focus is only on manufacturers rather than the full supply chain. Other downstream entities like pharmacy benefit managers, wholesalers, pharmacy, and payers also contribute to the final price paid by consumers. And finally, reporting requirements treat drug pricing as if there's only one market functioning under a single set of practices, which does not reflect the complex factors such as incentives, economic environments, and business arrangements, driving prices, and, and rebate practices. So in fact, when rebates and discounts are accounted for, we see that the net price of drugs has increased by only 1% in 2021, and those rebates total $236 billion in 2021. Neither Senate File 168 or any other bill under consideration by the Minnesota legislature addresses the limitations noted by the Department of Health, and we would urge this committee to delay the implementation of the board until these data limitations have been addressed. An additional data problem with Senate File 168 is the requirement that the Medicare maximum fair price is used prior to its implementation in Medicare. We would urge the committee to change this requirement to an option. We have all heard testimony today about patients struggling to afford and access their medicines. However, the bill does not guarantee that patients will pay the upper payment limit for their medications. This is because a patient's health plan sets the cost sharing amount for a prescription drug, which Senate File 168 does not tie to the UPL amount. This means that if this bill were to pass, patients may not save anything at the pharmacy counter. And finally, please understand that Senate File 168 is about provider billing and payer reimbursement by setting the amount a provider can bill at the UPL and the amount a payer can reimburse at the UPL. The bill does not set the original price for prescription drug, which presents a number of supply chain issues, including if a provider can purchase the drug at the UPL. Madam Chair, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to provide testimony today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Um, next, we have Bob Miller and Judy Cook. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Miller. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, my, name is, <clears throat> my name is Bob Miller. I live in Prior Lake uh, with my wife, Mary. I am here because I am among the nearly 40% of the people living with multiple sclerosis who have altered the use of their medications due to cost. When I was diagnosed almost 20 years ago, it started with a tingling in my cheek, then I got dizzy, my speech would slur, and then I started having difficulty with one of my legs. 
At one point, it got so bad, I was slurring my speech and getting dizzy about every 15 minutes. Within a few months, I was prescribed beta-seron, a disease-modifying therapy, or DMT, that has been shown to modify the course of MS and prevent the accumulation of disability. Symptoms and prescription therapies vary widely for unpredictable MS, and beta-seron happened to work for me for 12 years. When introduced in 1993, beta-seron cost $11,500 per year. By 2022, its cost had risen to over $111,000 annually. Median cost for MSDMTs was $94,000 in 2022. When generics are included, it's $80,000. Insurance companies often treat generics for specialty drugs just like a specialty drug with higher costs. As I transitioned insurance companies uh, carriers seven years ago, I checked in to see what my out-of-pocket costs would be. I was told I would pay over $10,000 a year out-of-pocket. I'm retired and on a fixed income, and that amount jeopardizes my retirement security. When I stopped taking beta seron, my doctors told me I was rolling the dice with my health. Luckily, I have not had a relapse, but I don't know what my future holds. I strongly feel that no one should have to make that kind of decision. Medications can't improve lives if people can't afford to access them. The National MS Society applauds SF-168's intent to bring more transparency, discussion, and attention to the high cost of prescription drugs for people with chronic conditions. We appreciate that the Prescription Drug Affordability Act uh, utilizes multi, a multi-stakeholder approach in rec acknowledging the roles of health plans, employers, clinical researchers, drug manufacturers, patients, and others. People with chronic illness like MS need to know that they'll be able to get the life-changing medications they need when they need it. I urge your support for the Prescription Drug Affordability Act, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Cook, please state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Judy Cook. On behalf of the Association for Accessible Medicines, representing the generic and biosimilar manufacturers, AAM is opposed to Senate File 168. The first sections of the bill only apply to lower cost generic drugs and does not address the cost drivers in the prescription drug marketplace. This is misplaced. Generics and biosimilar medicines save patients money. Generics represent 91% of prescriptions filled, but only 18% of drug spending and only 2% of total health care spending. Generic drugs are typically 70 to 80% lower and can even be 95% lower than the brand. This bill allows the Attorney General and private individuals to sue a generic company when the WAC, the wholesale acquisition cost, not the patient cost, increases by a dollar a day. But no suit will be filed for the same brand drug, even if it's increased by thousands of dollars a month. Generic drugs are in a competitive marketplace, sold to wholesalers at a national level and usually outside of Minnesota. The WAC is not the price the wholesaler pays. That's negotiated and typically lower. Once sold by the generic manufacturer, it is the wholesaler who determines which generic manufacturers of products are sold to Minnesota pharmacies. It is not the generic manufacturer who sets patient out-of-pocket costs, yet the bill specifies that entities downstream who increase the price consumers pay at the pharmacy cannot be sued. So regardless of where a price increase occurs, only the generic manufacturer can be sued. The fundamental question is why are you targeting generic drugs? This was included in the Attorney General's original drug price task force recommendations, but it included generics and brands. We have questions about this bill that you should want the answers to. Does this apply to all drug transactions or only those in Minnesota, as one of the bill proponents suggests? If it's all transactions, a federal court has already found a similar law unconstitutional. If it's just those in Minnesota, you are singling out the four Minnesota-based generic manufacturers out of more than 400 generic manufacturers. Why is there a requirement for reporting all drugs discontinued by a generic manufacturer to the Board of Pharmacy? Is it only the drugs that the AG determines are price gouging that are prohibited from withdrawing from the state? Does that make sense? 
Is it all discontinued drugs that a manufacturer decides to stop making, and if so, what's the purpose? I, I just want to give you an example. If a generic manufacturer has a significant increase in their cost of raw materials and decide they'd rather discontinue making the drug than increase the price, under this bill, they face a penalty of $500,000. Why does nothing in the bill require that a Minnesota consumer or consumers actually pay an increased price at the pharmacy for the AG or an individual to pursue an action? Through multiple committee hearings, none of the examples provided would actually be covered by this part of the bill. So I'm not sure what's being accomplished. It certainly will not reduce the cost of drugs and could decrease access. Finally, and I am finishing, Senate File 168 has requirements that only apply to generic manufacturers at a time when there is increasing competitive pressure on U.S. generic manufacturers. These additional mandates only on generic fan manufacturers who are trying to compete in a global market will impact their competitiveness. We are already seeing more generic drug shortages and the added burdens of this bill are counterproductive. The focus on generic drugs is misplaced and provides false hope to consumers that you are do doing something to bring drug prices down. We appreciate the conversations with Senator Morrison, but through many stops, the bill stays the same. So we encourage you to oppose Senate File 168, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, last, we have Linda Larson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Wickland and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity today. <clears throat> My name is Linda Larson. I'm a proud third generation, lifelong Minnesotan, and I'm a member of the Minnesota Farmers Union. I speak in support of Senate File 168 on behalf of the members of the Farmers Union, and I want to thank Senator Morrison for sponsoring this legislation. Most of our members are family farmers and are small businesses in rural communities. Establishing a prescription drug affordability board to stop the un unchecked price gouging of prescription drugs could have a huge impact. Here's my story. During the height of the pandemic, I contracted bacterial bronchial pneumonia. It wasn't COVID. But because of the shutdowns, I was unable to make a doctor's appointment. So two trips to the emergency room and six video appointments over a seven-week period of time, and each time was with a different person, <clears throat> someone finally found a way to help. They said I should be hospitalized, but there were no available beds. These two, prescription, these two prescription inhalers opened my airways enough for me to be able to breathe without gasping for air. It took two more months before I could go up or down a stairway without stopping. My throat and lungs are permanently damaged due to the longevity of my illness, and now I have asthma. I will need these two inhalers for the rest of my life due to my damaged pulmonary system, and I'm now at high risk for developing COPD and or emphysema. And that's so ironic because I have never, ever been a tobacco user. This inhaler is a steroid. My copay at my local pharmacy for three of them, three, four months ago, was $411 for three of them. Three weeks ago, the copay for the same three inhalers was $616 out of pocket. Now that's out of pocket after insurance. $616, a 67% increase in my out of pocket costs in less than in 90 days. According to the pharmacist, when I challenged that, this inhaler for three without insurance sells for $939 in the United States. 
that this exact same inhaler in Canada sells outright for $144 for three of them. That's $795 less than here in Minnesota. And here's another topper. Just last week, I saw on CNN that this inhaler is now suddenly in short supply. Guess what's going to happen to the price next time I have to refill this prescription? <clears throat> I know too many people with too many stories who say that this kind of price gouging is unsustainable for them and their loved ones. So once again, we urge you to please pass Senate File 168 to establish a Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the, the testifiers. Uh, members, questions? Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And there's been a lot of things uh, covered and said by our testifiers. And one of the things uh, I'll just mention early on, I'll have some stuff coming up to uh, kind of back that up, but is the constitutionality of what this does um, in going after drug wholesalers, but or the manufacturers, I should say. But we all got a copy of this in our packets. I just happened to run off a colored copy, but the fact is it shows the chart. Manufacturer sells the medicine to a wholesaler. We're targeting the manufacturer, but next steps. Wholesaler sells to pharmacy. Three, pharmacy dispenses medicine to patient and is responsible for collecting patient copay, co-insurance at the point of sale. Now that would sound like a great place to stop. That would be from start to finish. But then we enter in four. Pharmacy benefit manager pays pharmacy negotiated ingredient cost of medicine plus dispensing fee. Five, health plan pays PBM negotiated ingredient cost of medicine plus dispensing fee. Six, manufacturer pays rebate and administration fee to PBM. And finally, seven, PBM typically returns majority of the rebate to health plan. There's a whole lot of moving pieces in this, and we're just targeting the manufacturer, which isn't right. Um, yeah, we're all concerned about the cost of drugs or the cost of health care, but we need to look at the whole picture if we're actually going to move the needle at all. Um, and something I thought of as I was going through some of this in the last couple of days, you could take the simple thing of a pen that we buy. Manufacturer makes it for probably pennies on a dollar, but then it gets shipped to another place where they take the order and break it down into smaller quantities. And this one, I had some writing put on it, which is probably the third or the fourth stop in it. And in the end, I pay, I don't know, uh, a buck a piece or whatever it is. But it started out. That's the same thing we're working here with, with the drugs. These things start out awfully cheap. And we're blaming them for whatever the price is at the counter. In, it. in a lot of cases, there's no connectivity. It's um, just the way that it's landed. But a few things in the bill, um, page two, we're on uh, 2.10. And again, it, I just asked a question. It, we're going after the manufacturer. Why only them when we see that this picture is got a lot of players involved? Um, and actually, players that have a lot more to do with the pricing than the actual manufacturer at this case. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Senator Utke. Um, you know, the, the pricing begins with the price that the manufacturer sets. So the whole chain of events in the complex and convoluted supply chain that is the pharmaceutical um, industry uh, begins with that um, initial price. And I would, I also just want to, we're in the health committee, so, you know, I want to sort of get us focused on people and patients and making sure that people are able to access the medicines that they need to be healthy and to thrive and in some cases to survive. 
Um, your example of the pen is an interesting one, but it also highlights, I think, how pharmaceutical drugs are different than other commodities. They are a public good. They they are. It's it's different of how much I can choose whether or not I want to buy this pen. I can't choose whether or not I need insulin um, or my medicine for my multiple sclerosis, for example. Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that highlights what I was after with the pen. It shows the manufacture of these drugs, in most cases, has no control over that price. They may be pennies on the dollar when they leave their um, manufacturing location, and who knows what that price is, and that's what our consumers get hit with. Um, so I think they do have a lot in common, but uh, then on page 4.23, we've got the prohibition on withdrawal of generic or off-patient drugs for sale. How can we do that? That's a business decision made by a drug manufacturer, and if they get to a point where they're not able to remain profitable or be able to buy the products to make that drug, and they decide to withdraw, how can we force them to continue to manufacture? This is a business thing. Senator Morrison. Madam Chair and, and Senator Utke, um, I do want to point out that um, there are triggers for a review of the cost of drugs and whether or not an upper payment limit would be appropriate. So drugs that are affordable will not be reviewed. So this only applies to certain medications. Um, the, the one that you're referencing around um, generics um, is just a way to protect patients um, so that they can continue to access drugs. We, there is someone from the Attorney General's office on as well to answer questions, although I assume that the bulk of those will be in the Judiciary Committee. Senator Rutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. But once again, if I'm that drug manufacturer and I come up just as the raw product that I need to make something, uh, the example was used earlier is uh, either it's way out of the price range to remain competitive. I mean, there's a, many, many reasons that could come up. And, I, you know, I see the advance notices and things, but that is something that we don't have any control over. Um, if that manufacturer comes up and says, hey, I can't make it anymore, I mean, they can't make it anymore. And then you stand up. The penalty, which follows right up after that, $500,000, and we have the Attorney General involved. So, um, you know, I'm just picking out some of the things that I see that are quite toxic. Um, and then I'll hop on to page 6, the Pre Prescription Drug Affordability Board. Um, yes, there are some members from the House and Senate, but other than that, it's seven government-appointed members who, as elected members, we have no say in who those people are, but yet they're going to be overseeing our, uh, our drugs and considering what's affordable and what isn't. Um, I don't think that's a good idea either. I think it should be more transparent than that. There should be a, a way to, for whether it's uh, the legislature or somebody to be involved, that's going to I, to me, just create a lot of challenges for the administration that they don't need. But going back to a few of the documents and things that I have found on this type of legislation, and it starts um, U.S. Court of Appeals back in 2018 in Maryland, which was one of the early states to try this. It was ruled on, declared unconstitutional. Um, that has led to uh, some other follow-up um, in June of 2021. The, you know, this same type of legislation has been tried in other states, and in this case, the state of Maine, the governor looked at it and vetoed their bill. Um, December of 2022, most recently, state of New York, again, trying to do the same thing. Um, in this case, the governor just returned it not approved and went on to the fact of uh, it being unconstitutional, et cetera. We should, 
we can learn from what others are doing too. And uh, this language is not something that can work. And so if, if we're going to try to uh, help out and uh, work on the uh, cost of in our medical costs and stuff, I think there's different ways that we need to approach it because uh, this one is, seems to be a broken model. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Utke. Um, Senator Abler. Thanks, Madam Chair, and I'm aware of the time, so I'll just uh, kind of go through a few points here. And uh, I think Senator Utke, uh, so Senator Morrison, I like the idea of your bill. I, I, I think you're a good author for this project, and uh, the thoughts I'm going to offer you, I hope you can take with the sincerity that I uh, bring them. I, at this point, I'm, I'm not going to vote for or against it today. I, I'm trying to get it to a place I could vote yes on the floor at least. But, um, but so um, looking at some of the letters, there's the, you know, the glowing reviews about what this can be. Um, I just first have a question. I added the woman who had the inhaler. Was that a generic or a brand drug? Do you know? Senator Morrison. Madam Chair and Senator Abler, I'm not certain. Oh, just a curious question. So, I mean, if this went up that much, then you're... But so, uh, and I, I'm curious. Senator right? Abler. You're not supposed to ask questions you don't know the answers to, but I thought maybe you'd just know offhand looking at it. <laughs> um, and so if it's a brand name, then that doesn't help. If it's a generic, well, let's figure out what happened with that and address it. Um, and so, and I... I'm presuming the intent of you as the author, you want this to actually make a, a difference and to work. And I was actually reading some of the notes. I noticed that ERISA is not in it or Medicare. Um, and just listen, I, I spent almost no time on this, but just I'm listening today and, and the out of state manufacturers and um, just to make sure that we actually are doing something that actually benefits somebody. And, um, and so at the end of the day, the, when the person is going to buy their medication, if there are cash, customer, they can notice it was not higher than it would have been or even a little cheaper or something in terms of a uh, product at the end. Um, I, um, I understand we can't do much with brand names. It sounds like so that's kind of frustrating. Um, but I was interested in some of the letters from the different uh, clinicians, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this. I'm just going to emphasize their concerns. I don't remember oncology or rheumatology people uh, peeling off to have concerns about it, and I know you understand that business far better than me. And so I know you'll be able to look at those concerns and figure out what to do with that, and then the rare diseases as well that I know are on your mind. Um, so I, I think that is you can make sure that things that are going pretty well are not messed with. Um, and just to, Senator Aki talked about the, the board. Um, it is it's your bill. At the end, you're going to design this thing, and you want it to go forward the way you want it, and maybe Governor Walls is going to be amazing to put on who you would like, but future governors would maybe not be. And so uh, very often we define who would be on it. The legislators are all fine, but maybe... Um, and as you draw from the, the universe of groups like the MMA or the Board of Pharmacy, as you single out people with expertise, throw a business person or two on there, some manufacturer or somebody just to kind of give it some credibility so it's not just a, you know, so it's a policy related thing that's um, important. Can I, I, Madam Chair, can I briefly respond to that? Oh, yeah. I, I just Senator wanted, Morrison. thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler, I just wanted you to know that I did in that amendment that I referenced, I did add um, two minority voices to the board. Um, I think it's important that we have both majority and minority voices there. I also added a lot of um, people who have expertise along the supply chain to the advisory council, including generics, including someone from the Rare Disease Advisory Council, including wholesalers and distributors. So, so there will be um, a lot of manufacturing voice advising the board. All right. And Senator Abler. Thanks, Madam Chair. It's not my bill. I just, like, I, I didn't know you had the amendment, and nobody asked me about that. I'm just telling you what I really think could work. Thank you. And then Pharma raises its, like, annual concerns about stuff and the economy is going to collapse and, you know, and, uh, you know, but they, there is a, at least a singular good point here and just to reiterate that to make sure that the patients benefit in this very convoluted world of ours. Um, it's ironic that they, <laughs> I, don't know, I think, pharma, somebody, somebody in the campaign said I'm a friend of Big Pharma and I never have really been, but they, it's ironic uh, that they, they complain about the, um, I mean, they mentioned, excuse me, um, that's a pejorative. Uh, they talk about this maximum 
Medicare, fair price, and it's in process. And there's many operation, operational and legal issues to be sorted out, probably because they're suing them. So, um, so I, I am happy to chat with you further offline. And you just want it to work. And so that the good you want, and if indeed it was a generic that went up that much, then we can protect people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think you touched upon this, uh, Senator Morrison, but we continuously treat health care and medications like they are optional goods. Right? We are not talking about purses. We are not talking, unfortunately, about pens. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's health care. It's, it's an optional thing. We should let the free market reign. How many years are we going to sit here and have the same conversation? How long are we going to have the same talking points over and over again while patients show up at the testifying table and tell us these awful stories? And inhalers, which got me going, is why I'm here today. It's because of inhalers. Because I could not take one more phone call from a patient at the pharmacy saying, I can't get the inhaler you want me to get. I cannot afford it. And now that I'm in the ER, I see the other end of that. I see the patients having asthma attacks regularly because they can't get their inhalers. And yet here we are having the same conversations we're always having. My favorite part, though, of all of this um, is that every time a bill is presented to increase drug transparency prices, the chamber invariably comes up here and says, we can't touch the free market. We can't do that. It's not a free market when people have no choice. And then pharma comes up and invariably says, ah, oh, you guys, it's not going to work. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. And yet I hear zero other options to solve the problem. I don't ever hear anyone say, maybe we can go ahead and cut back on the profits that pharmaceutical companies make, which are significantly higher than almost every single other industry in the world. And so, oh, I feel my pulse up here again. Uh, I really want to thank you for this bill, Senator Morrison. It is one step in the absolute right direction that we are taking to prevent stories like we are hearing today of patients not getting their medications uh, and not getting the treatment that they need while other people become richer and richer and richer off of this very broken system. Thank you. Members, any other questions or comments before we go to... A vote. <clears throat> Seeing no other um, questions, um, thank you, Senator Morrison, for bringing this bill forward. And it is something that needs to go to multiple other stops. And so I'm sure you'll have a chance to kind of consider uh, what you heard today and, and concerns. And um, I do agree that, you know, this is an area that we absolutely need to take action that can have uh, you know, a meaningful impact on people and their uh, ability to, to get access to the medications that they need to live. So I appreciate your work and um, continued work to, to make this bill move forward in a workable way. So thank you. Um, thank and, you, Madam Chair. Oh, um, and the motion, um, Senate file number 168 um, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Is that your motion? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. The bill, uh, Senate file number 168 is passed and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. And um, we have reached um, the conclusion of our business today, and uh, the meeting is adjourned.